Ecology, simply put, is the study of interactions. Interactions can occur at different levels, all the way from individual species to the entire biosphere of our planet. In this video, we will dive a bit deeper into what ecologists study about the natural world, including many of its interactions. Within the realm of ecology, a limiting factor is something that can restrict the distribution of a species. These limiting factors can either be biotic or abiotic. Let's recall that biotic means living and abiotic means non-living. Simple abiotic limiting factors include light, water temperature, and pH, while biotic factors include relationships between other organisms like predators, competition, or types of symbiotic relationships. The relationship between these factors and the organisms within an ecosystem can cause some species to flourish while it could limit the production and reproduction of others. A scientist by the name of Victor Ernest Schelfold proposed the idea of tolerance describing how populations live within the realm of limiting factors. This law of tolerance states that populations have optimal survival conditions within critical minimal and maximal thresholds. Looking at these two examples, you will see that most organisms thrive within their optimal range, where organisms that fall near the tolerance limit experience too much stress for them to live or grow efficiently. Many scientists today take advantage of this knowledge to grow crops in optimal conditions where they know they will get the highest returns. Every species, like this dung beetle here, plays a specific role in its ecosystem. This is called their ecological niche. So what role does this dung beetle play with this ball of feces? Good question. The beetles depicted here play the role of detritivores within this ecosystem by feeding upon the dead organic matter. This recycles the nutrients back into the system to be used again within the beetle. While every species plays a specific role in the environment, sometimes two species can end up having a similar niche. If two species occupy the same niche in the same habitat, they will end up outcompeting one another until one is excluded or the role changes. This first set of graphs describes competitive exclusion, which is a phenomenon characterized by one species using the resources more efficiently than the other. This will eventually drive the other species into extinction, as seen in the third graph. Additionally, a different type of outcome that could occur if two species occupy the same role is resource partitioning. With resource partitioning, each organism will only occupy part of their niche, leaving room for other organisms to do the same. This example here shows birds occupying different parts of the same tree without competing for space, which allows everyone to survive. If they were alone on the tree, each bird would occupy all of the space, but because multiple species are trying to occupy the same space, they each take a section and everyone has their own, new, unique niche. Another complex interaction in ecological systems is predation, which describes when one organism, the predator, hunts and feeds on another organism, the prey. Because the predator population is reliant on the prey to survive, these two species are heavily intertwined meaning if the population of one changes, the other one will also change. Let's take a look at this example between the lynx and the hare. The lynx is a predator to the hare, which is the prey. As the prey population increases, shortly after, the predator population also increases. This is because the predator population has more prey to consume, which supports an increase in population size. But once the predator population size gets large, the prey size drastically falls because too many predators are hunting them for food. Shortly after the fall of the prey population, you will see the predator population fall as well because there is now not enough food to support a large population of predators. This cycle continues to oscillate with the predator population, completely dependent upon the population size of the prey. This concept is known as a predator-prey relationship and is a well-studied phenomenon within the realm of ecology. Herbivory is another interaction studied in ecology and is defined as the act of an animal solely consuming plant material. Herbivores, like the deer and caterpillar pictured, can either be beneficial or harmful to an environment. 
An example of a beneficial herbivore would be an animal that consumes fruits and, in the process, spreads the seeds to a new location away from the original plant. This will ensure that the seeds get dispersed and hopefully planted in an area where they can survive. A harmful example would be an organism that overconsumes plants in an area causing plants or crops to die out. Aside from predation and herbivory, there are a few other important interactions between species that ecologists study. These are commensalism, where one organism benefits from the interaction and the other one is not affected, mutualism, where both organisms benefit from the interaction, and parasitism, where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. The next three slides cover these three interactions in greater detail. A mutualistic relationship is one where both organisms benefit from the interaction. The example in this image is zooanthale and coral. Zooanthale is a species of unicellular algae that is photosynthetic, depicted as the small orange dots in the image. The algae live within the coral, polyps, which provide it with protection and a source of inorganic molecules, like carbon dioxide, so it can undergo photosynthesis. In turn, the algae provide the coral with oxygen, glucose, and other organic molecules produced through photosynthesis. Both organisms benefit from the interaction, which again describes the relationship as being mutual. Next, a commensal relationship is one that benefits one organism and does not help or harm the other, leaving it unaffected. The image on this page is showing the relationship between a remora, the smaller fish, and a shark. The remora follow and attach themselves to the shark and eat any of the uneaten food scraps left over from the meal. This benefits the remora and does not help or harm the shark in any way. Parasitism describes an ongoing interaction between two species whereby one species benefits at the other's expense. The image on this slide is showing a tongue-eating louse inside the mouth of a fish. This parasite eats the fish's tongue and then acts like its replacement. While it is connected, it steals food that the fish is trying to eat for itself. In this scenario, the louse benefits and the fish is harmed. Finally, the last interaction that we need to discuss is that of a keystone species. A keystone species is a species that has a disproportionately large impact on the environment relative to its population size. In other words, this species is so important to the ecosystem that if something were to happen to it, the ecosystem could fall apart, much like if you took the keystone brick out of this archway. All of the other pieces would go tumbling down. An example of a keystone species would be the wolves in Yellowstone Park. The wolves are not the largest population in Yellowstone, but they are one of the most important. Take the wolves out of the equation and the elk populations increase to such large numbers that they overgraze important plants that other species rely on. This means that beavers could disappear because they no longer would have resources to build shelter and dams. I could keep going, but I think you get the point. We need keystone species within ecosystems to promote a healthy balance of biodiversity.